Yeah, welcome and uh, thank you all for coming this afternoon. My name is Klaus Mielich and I'm the director of the Montgomery Fellows Program here at Dartmouth. Next year, the Montgomery Fellows Program uh, celebrates its 40th anniversary. And thanks to the generosity of Harley and Kenneth Montgomery, who graduated from Dartmouth in 1924 and who launched the Montgomery Endowment with his wife in 1977, the program has brought more than 240 public intellectuals, scholars, writers, artists, musicians, performers, social activists, and politicians to Dartmouth to give uh, students and faculty the opportunity to meet the most distinguished individuals from all fields of human endeavor. Our current Montgomery Fellow is David Montgomery. The identical names uh, are more or less coincidental. David Montgomery is a professor of geography at the University of Washington in Seattle and has been a MacArthur Fellow in 2008. As a geomorphologist, uh, to specify the field a little bit more, he studies and quantifies the topographic features of the Earth and other planets in order to understand why landscapes look the way they do. David Montgomery has developed a particular interest in the landforms created by rivers, streams, and dams. And three weeks ago, some of you might have been there, we screened a documentary entitled Damnation, and the title speaks, I guess, for itself, in which David Montgomery is featured together with a number of other critics and scholars of the excessive dam constru uh, construction in the United States and worldwide. David Montgomery is the author of several scholarly and popular science book, among them Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, and I stress this title in particular because it ties in into the topic of today's talk that he will deliver together with his wife and co-author Anne Bickley. Anne Bickley is a biologist and an avid gardener, and I want to stress this aspect too because her studies of microbes inside our bodies and in the ground, or better, in the dirt, to pick up the title, play a major role in the talk this afternoon. The title of Anne's and David's talk, The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health, is also the title of the first book they co-authored, the first book they co-authored together, and which will be in the bookstores in about two weeks. And thanks to the Norwich Bookstore, we already have copies for you available outside on the table. And those of you who missed the chance uh, of the book signing before the talk will have another chance to get a signed copy after the talk. The hidden half of nature, the microbial roots of life and health, looks into something that we usually do not pay much attention to, but which has a tremendous impact upon our lives, and that are microbes. The book weaves history, science, and personal experience to tell the story of humanity's tangled relationship with the tiniest creatures on Earth. But the hidden half of nature is also the intellectual and personal result of a happy marriage, if I may say so, a marriage not only in the personal sense of two wonderful people and guests that we have here at the moment, but also in the academic sense, in so far as we have the marriage of biology and geography, or a biologist and a geographer. Please join me in welcoming David Montgomery and Anne Bickley. Thank you very much. Great, well, thank you, Klaus. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm not Anne, I'm Dave, and uh, we're going to be talking about The Hidden Half of Nature Day. It's our latest book. It's the first one that we've co-authored together, and I'm a geologist, she's a biologist. What we want to go into is why would we write a book about microbes, the part of nature that we can't actually see? This is, of course, the cover of the book. If you want to follow us on Facebook or Twitter or that kind of stuff, we've finally joined the modern world and gotten on social media, but what we really want to talk about today are these guys up here now, the, micro the are microbial characters. 
This is what we call the hidden half of nature, the part of nature that's too small for us to see and detect with our own senses. So why would a geologist and a biologist write about that part of nature that we can't actually detect with the evolutionary equipment that we were born with, um, that we would need technology to actually study and look at and see? And I think that the real answer uh, is, well, partly we'll unfold the story of how we got through that in the talk, and that's how we organized the book. Um, but we're living through a legitimate, I think, scientific revolution in the way that we see and think about the microbial world. Now, the last really big scientific revolution of my field of geology was plate tectonics, and that played out before I even got to college. So I didn't even get to participate, and I got to learn about it, I get to teach about it. But when Ann and I started looking into what's happening and what we've been thinking about in the microbial world, and in particular microbial ecology in the last couple decades, the way that we actually think about these guys has been changing greatly enough that I think that it will count as a legitimate revolution in thought down the line. Uh, and we got fascinated by it, got essentially sucked into thinking about it. Uh, and you know, the characters that we have are there, archaea and bacteria. Uh, archaea used to be thought to be like bacteria. There's the fungi, the protists, uh, single-celled organisms that have a, a well-defined nucleus. And then the are they alive or not viruses. This is sort of our cast of characters, but we're not going to get lost in the individual ones in here. What I want to start with is essentially thinking about that title of the book, The Hidden Half of Nature. It's meant to be taken literally, because if you actually sort of weighed up all the microscopic life on this planet and compared its mass to all the plants and animals that we know about, they're about the same. Literally about half of nature is smaller than about a micron, about smaller in the invisible part of the spectrum of nature. And what we have here are the, the finest scale of DNA up to the scale of people in cycles of fact powers of 10. So it's a logarithmic scale jumping up in a factor of 10 each size. And what I want to show is that there's five orders of magnitude in range of size in the microscopic world, the invisible world, this hidden half of nature. And that's the same range of sizes from an amoeba up to a person. So you can think that there really is this whole ecological world of interactions of organisms that is as rich and diverse and crosses as many scales in the world that we can't see as there is in the world that we can see. And there's an estimate, if you wanted to estimate how many microbes there are on the planet, organisms that are, that are in that invisible part of nature, the, the best estimate we were able to come up with is it's a one followed by 30 zeros. That's a nonillion. And that's an awful lot of zeros to follow a one. Microbes are pretty small, of course. You can't see them. But if you stretched a nonillion microbes end to end, they would reach to Alpha Centauri and back. So if they could ever get organized, they could get off this planet before we could figure out how to get to the next star. For, fortunately, they're even more disorganized than we are. Um, but the point is that there's half of this world of nature is, in this in, uh, is too small for us to see it in the invisible world. So how did Ann and I, a geologist and a biologist, get to the point where we're writing about microbes? And this, what started us on this journey was probably the, one of the most unlikely acts to generate that result that, that you could think of. We bought a house in North Seattle after I got tenure at the University of Washington. And the house, which uh, is this, came with a lawn that was essentially an old growth Seattle lawn. It was a 90-year-old lawn. Uh, there was nothing growing in it. The people that, had, uh, that we bought the house from had done nothing to the yard for almost a century. And Anne was a gardener, as you'll hear more about. She really desired a garden uh, bursting with life, and a lawn didn't cut it to, to her. So we peeled back that lawn, and what did we find underneath? We found that I should have dug a soil pit before we bought the house. <laughs> You'd think that as somebody who's dug holes all around the world looking to see what's below the ground surface and below the soil, I might have thought to do that in my own home. But no, I didn't think. That was an urban lot, didn't cross my mind. When we peeled that lawn off, what do we find? We didn't find a single worm. There was no macroscopic life, no life forms that we could see inhabiting that relatively sterile soil. It was uh, the bane of Seattle gardeners, glacial till, essentially the kind of material, well, it's pieces of Canada, actually, that were scraped off by an ice sheet from up in British Columbia, bulldozed down into the Puget Sound area, dumped in Seattle, and then overridden by a mile-high wall of ice, you know, three times the height of the Space Needle, if you're familiar with that in Seattle compressed into what is essentially nature's concrete. It got cleaned up to, to um, put the lawn in. We instantly peeled the lawn off a century later, and we still had basically sterile dirt. We had the geology part of fertile soil. 
we didn't have the biology part. And if you think of what makes for fertile, fertile soil, it's the combination of mineral matter, the geology, and living organisms and dead organisms, the biology. We had the geology, we didn't have the biology, and and the gardener decided to take matters into her own hand and try and rebuild and restore our soil so she could actually make a garden. The original motivation uh, for filling wheelbarrow loads full of organic matter um, that she could uh, steal from the neighbor's oak leaves in the fall. We've noticed all this activity starting around here lately of people starting to clean up leaves. She started to clean up some of our neighbor's leaves, uh, bring them back, put them on our planting beds to cover the bare ground that we had um, then try and actually keep moisture in the soil was the original motivation. But over time, what we started to see happening is that material, that organic matter, the, the dead stuff that we would add, would start to decay and disappear. And this got us thinking about what was happening. And what we were adding uh, in, the, in terms of the organic matter that she was adding to the yard, uh, leaves that we could get from the neighbors, get from our own trees, wood chips that we could get, our, we could convince arborists to drop in the, in the driveway when they had take down a limb or a tree in the neighborhood. And we'd put those on the planting beds to try and keep the moisture in. We'd plant green plants, what we call uh, nitrogen-rich plants, so that we could actually put those back into the soil. So we'd have carbon-rich sources, nitrogen-rich sources that could eventually rebuild uh, the soil. We would add coffee grounds. You can go to almost any street corner in Seattle and go to behind the coffee shop that's there. And every evening, they will put bags of their spent coffee grounds out. And they love it when gardeners take them away. And so we did that, it's essentially a free source of nitrogen if you sort of forget everything that it took to get that bag of coffee to Seattle in the first place. Uh, we started also composting uh, our kitchen scraps and, and uh, built a worm bin and we started recycling the organic matter, the organic waste from our own kitchen, bringing that all back into, the, into our garden. And Anne started doing something that I was deeply skeptical of at the start, which is starting to make compost tea, a microbial brew, where she came home from a uh, a gardening show with a, a bucket and an aerator that could bubble oxygen through, through um, um, a, a filled bucket of, of liquid the way that you would aerate, say, an aquarium for a fish tank. And you put a source of sugar in it, and you put microbes in it, a microbial inoculant. And what she used is she used our worm compost to inoculate this microbial tea, feed them sugar, bubble oxygen through it, and what are you doing? You're breeding trillions of microbes. You're essentially multiplying. Uh, the microbes that are in the worm compost. And she would spray this back on the plants, spray it on the soil, spray it all around our yard uh, to, in an effort to uh, bring um, beneficial microbial life into this sterile medium of dead dirt that we had on the, on the, the lot. So how much of a difference does, did this make? Did it actually do much of anything? This is where I was really surprised. Because after about five years, I finally dug that soil pit and looked at what was happening because Ann was starting to notice changes in the yard. The soil was getting darker. Uh, things were fluffing up. The, the soil was starting to change. And these are her pruning shears for scale. Uh, and if you look at, at this hole, you start at the bottom, that's still that glacial till. And up here, you've got the leaves and the mulch and the compost that's been added at the surface. But look at what's in between. We've got about two inches of actually decent soil. The plant roots are growing down through it and they're essentially grounding out on the, um, um, down on that till. They're not going down into it. But we've built about two inches of soil in about five years. If you look at how fast nature builds soils, it takes centuries to build a single inch. And why was this of significance to us in our thinking? Well, that book that Klaus mentioned earlier called Dirt was one that I had written at that time that looked at how ancient societies plowed through their soil and that destroyed their own longevity by causing erosion of their soil at a pace far faster than nature could build it. Yet here, Anne was turning that ancient problem around and building soil far faster than nature could. Couple inches a year, that means you could build about a meter as thick as almost any topsoil gets on this planet in only one century where if you ask the USDA how long it takes to form an inch of topsoil, they'll tell you 500 years for an inch. This was clearly something that caused me to start to change my thinking. It also, because it, it started to open the door to thinking about that we can reverse the problem of soil degradation and actually rebuild soil far faster than nature would on her own. And the explosion of life that happened above ground really changed our life in our yard and started us thinking about, well, what was actually the connection between putting this organic matter back, just layering it on the surface of the soil, and how does that translate into essentially a blossoming and blooming of life in the yard, including vegetable beds that were providing a fair amount of our own food in the spring and summer months when you can actually do that in Seattle because the sun is out occasionally. And 
One other thing we noticed is that the carbon content of our soil was changing. When we peeled that lawn back off, you notice the beach sand color of it? It had about a half a percent to one percent carbon content in the soil. Today, if you go to, uh, uh, you peel back our lawn now, it has about six to seven percent carbon content. You go to the planting bed, it's about nine percent. And if you go to our vegetable beds, it's up to 12 to 15 percent, which is virtually at the high end of the range for, the, for very fertile native soils anywhere in the world. So we've essentially rebuilt incredibly fertile soil in a very short time. And what was the key? It was really adding organic matter and restoring life to the soil. Uh, we noticed the kinds of uh, organisms that you see uh, that any gardener would be familiar with come back to the yard in a, in a, in a sequence that was very interesting that I'll get back to. But we, we eventually were led through looking into what could control the, such a rapid conversion of this organic matter into a burst of fertility and growth of new plants. We were led back to the part of nature that we couldn't see, the hidden half, the microbes that were essentially driving the cycle driving the breakdown of the organic matter and the conversion of it back into forms that could feed, and fertile, feed new life forms and essentially fertilize the soil. So what do we have here? We have a little ball of bacteria up there. and We've got fungi over here that are um, uh, uh, clustered around uh, the root hair of a plant. These are the sort of the finest scale life forms that the, all that organic matter is getting broken back down into and eventually consumed at the small scale. And they're very nutrient rich. They're rich in nitrogen, they're rich in phosphorus, they're rich in all the micronutrients that plants need for new growth because they are also um, uh, life forms. And what eats them? Little nematodes, little microarthropods. These guys graze on these guys and what do they do? They consume them and then they excrete them. They're putting out micro manure into the soil based on what they've eaten, which is they're grazing on these microbes that have eaten all that decaying organic matter. And their micro manure is incredibly rich in the kind of materials that plants need to build themselves back. You could think of them as tiny livestock that are manuring the fields from, in the soil from the inside. And if you start thinking about the hidden half of nature that way, you start thinking about, wow, what are all these connections that are happening within the soil? What's happening between those microbes and the plants? And it opens up a whole different view of the world of nature that's going on out of sight and out of mind, but that is actually central to the kind of agriculture that we depend on to run to essentially underpin civilization. And so if we step back and think about this a little bit in terms of where do plants get the, the raw materials to support their growth in life, um, you know, they get their carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere, they combine it with water through photosynthesis to build the, the carbohydrate building blocks of their own bodies, they get nitrogen from the atmosphere with the help of microbes in the root system, but those are just a couple of the compounds that they need to actually grow and assemble healthy bodies. Everything else that they got put, used to put together their bodies ultimately came out of rocks. And that's how a geologist could actually sort of think about these things, uh, because you're talking about potassium, you're talking about calcium, you're talking about all the micronutrients, uh, the metals that we need in very low concentrations, but they're nutrients, but they're micronutrients. We don't need a whole lot, but those, that stuff all came out of rocks and into the biological world, and organic matter, dead things, that, fall, that go into the soil like these trees, around here are trying to do with dropping all their leaves to return that material back to the soil, and why it can be sort of crazy to actually deny them uh, uh, the, the fruit of that labor, is when that material rots, it's rich in all the micronutrients they need for new growth for the very simple reason that it, they had been plants before. They had the stuff that it took to actually support life, and when they rot, it's the microbes that are actually facilitating the transfer, the decay and transfer of that material back into forms that the plants can once again take up. So as we started looking into this, we zeroed in on this zone uh, called the rhizosphere, the zone right around the tips of the roots of plants. It ranges from about a millimeter to a centimeter around uh, plant roots, and it's one of the most densely populated zones of life on this planet in terms of organisms per cubic centimeter or cubic meter, whatever unit you want to take. Um, the rhizosphere of plants is incredibly rich and diverse with life. And why is that? Well, it turns out that it's in part, in part due to a phenomena that changed my view of plant roots. When, when Ann and I took soil science together in graduate school, we were essentially taught that plant roots 
act as straws. They take up nutrients, they take up water, they feed the plants. And that's not wrong. But there's another thing going on. Plants also push material out into the soil. And it turns out that in the past several decades, scientists have, dis have established that plants can push up to 30 or 40 percent of all that matter that they fix through photosynthesis, they just push it out through their roots into the soil. Why would a self-respecting plant do that? Go through all that work and labor to actually capture solar energy, do the, the biogeochemical alchemy that turns that into life, and then just give it away out on the street uh, beneath its feet. Well, they're not. They're actually trading it. They're doing it for very real reasons. They're feeding the microbes in the rhizosphere. They're actually actively recruiting uh, microbes that do specialized things uh, because what happens in that rhizosphere? It acts like a biological bazaar. The plants are bringing sugars and proteins to the table and they're sending that out into the soil and the microbes consume them. Most of those exudates, as they're called, things that the plants exude out of their roots, get consumed by a microbe within about a millimeter to a centimeter of the plant root. And what do those microbes do? They, they produce their own metabolites. They eat that stuff, they turn it into something else, push it out of their bodies. And some, so you've got the plants pushing exudates out into the soil, this halo, if you will, this living halo of microbes that are consuming it and, the, and putting out their own metabolites, many of which the plants take back up because they're right by the roots and they're soluble. What kind of things are the, are the microbes making? They're making things like plant growth promoting hormones. The microbes are making plant hormones to help the plants grow. The plants are feeding the microbes. The microbes are promoting the health of the plant. And there's all kinds of other connections in terms of chemical signaling that, are, that is going on. But there's these beneficial symbiotic relationships between the microbes and the roots around the plants and the plants themselves. The microbes, in other words, are behaving really differently than how we've tended to think of them as pests and pathogens. Now, of course, there are pests and pathogens, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this kind of a relationship, where the roots are a two-way street and not just straws, really started to change our view of this system. And fungi, fun mycorrhizal fungi in particular, can extend their hyphae out a long way into the soil. At this scale, they're over on that wall somewhere. And they can specialize in mining things like phosphorus out of rock minerals. They bring them back to the plants and trade them for sugars. They act as root extensions, in other words, for the plants. And if you go back in geologic time, the very first plant fossils that we have from some 450 billion years ago have mycorrhizal fungi wrapped around the roots. The fungi helped the plants colonize the continents by helping them access the mineral nutrients that were in the soil, and they got paid off in sugars. The other things that we, um, uh, some of the kind of relationships that we noticed um, uh, in the literature um, uh, on along these lines are that when plants, when herb, insect herbivores would graze on plants, it can cause the plant to send a chemical signal out of its roots that basically is telling the soil microbes, hey, we're under attack. The, the microbes in the soil, very specialized ones, will produce compounds as their, met, their metabolites that get taken up back up by those plants and actually make the plant taste bad to that particular insect that was attacking it. In other words, there's communication going on. The, think about the defense system for a plant. If you're a plant, you're stuck in place. You can't get up and run away, say, like a rabbit could. But you can send chemical signals into the soil out through your roots to stimulate and feed microbes that produce specialized metabolites that you take back up and taste bad and chase the predator off. That's an ingenious defense strategy for a stuck-in-place organism. And these kind of thinking, these kind of relationships weren't even recognized several decades ago. It's all kind of new kind of thinking about the relationship between plants and the micro microbes in the soil. There were ideas about this extending back to the 19-teens and 30s, but it wasn't really understood how it worked. And, we and if we looked at the, the, the order in which life came back in our own yard, it actually was quite a striking progression. Uh, it was what we have over here on the left is the order in which life forms colonize the continents in sort of really big generalizable categories, the way you could look at the way that life came back in our yard. And we got the microbes first, then we got the tritivores, then we got the spiders, then we got the things that ate the spiders, then we got the birds that ate the birds that ate the spiders, all the way on up to the point where a baby, where an eagle took a baby crow out of, out of the tree next to our yard. But the point is, is that the order in which life came back in our yard mirrored the order in which life evolved on the continents and colonized the continents. 
And I don't think this is a direct successional analog, but I think that there's, it tells us something very basic about the way that ecosystems are built. They're built upon a microbial foundation and built up and organized from that level up to the higher order of life forms that we know as the nature that we know. And this tells us a lot, we think, uh, about the origin of, of the defensive systems and, and the maintenance of health in the plant world that we depend on for our own health. And there's one other, one other um, thing that I want to share with you before I turn the talk over to Anne for the second half of the talk. Um, and that is the work of this, this woman here, Lynn Margulis, one of the um, most intriguing scientists of the 20th century who came up with the idea back in the 1960s that the life forms that we know, the animals, fungi, and plants, the sort of the macroscopic world of nature that Anne and I trained to study, uh, were evolved from the mergers of microscopic life forms. That back several billion years ago, an Archean encountered a swimming bacteria, and that one tried to eat the other, and was only partially successful because they both survived. And they formed a new organism, a, symbi a symbiotic organism. It's a very, you know, how, many, how often have you eaten something and it survived? It's not a common occurrence. Something that happened that formed a merged organism, uh, and that's the origin of the first nucleated cell. Then after about 800 million years, uh, the uh, product, a descendant of the product, that first merger consumed another bacterium, an oxygen-breathing bacterium, and, that, and created a second merger. That oxygen-breathing bacterium was the ancestor of the mitochondria that power every cell in your body, every cell in every plant, and every cell in every fungi. Another merger happened uh, again a few hundred million years later, a third merger when the product of that second merger uh, consumed a photosynthesizing bacterium, the forerunner of the chloroplasts that are in plants today. And so she was arguing that the, the rich, diverse world of nature that we know literally has its evolutionary roots back in symbioses and collaborations between micro microscopic life forms, between microbes. And so if you look at the subtitle of our book, the, the, um, the microbial roots of life and health. The roots of health in plants and the roots of all macroscopic life extend back to the microbial world as well. So, so far I've tried to explain the literal nature of both halves of the talk, and I'm gonna turn the rest of the talk over to Anne so that she can um, expand on the connections to the other part that we figured out along the way. Great, thank you. <clears throat> well, um, delightful to see all of you. Thank you for coming. And I think you can tell by now that um, we were pretty enthralled and thrilled with the microbial world. It had restored our soil. It really, we, we think, had done the heavy lifting in our garden. Uh, and this uh, improved our lives in countless ways. But as happens with life, sometimes you get a big fat plot twist, something you don't expect. And that's what happened to us. We were partway through writing this book. I'd gone for routine physical and found out about 10 days later that I had cancer, that it was malignant, and that of all things, it was caused by a microbe, the human papillomavirus or HPV. So <clears throat> I am happy to say now, however, I am cancer free. It was cervical cancer. But at the time, this was a lot of pause for thought, right? All of a sudden, the microbial world is not so warm and wonderful and fuzzy at all. It has this duality about it. And so as we began really diving into the human microbiome, what Dave talked about was the plant microbiome we realized um, that there was this whole other dimension that we didn't really quite appreciate. So uh, first of all, the microbiome is a burgeoning explosive area of science. And this is just a graph to show you that. If, if you take that, you know, uh, if you search for that term on uh, PubMed, you can see the growth that has happened in this time frame in just over 14 years going from 78 or so up to over 4,000. And this is not stopped. If this, if this graph continued over, you would continue to see the same thing. So what is your microbiome? It's actually something uh, pretty straightforward to think about once you get used to the fact that microbes are a part of us. 
So the microbiome are the microbial communities that are indigenous or the ones that should be with us in and on our bodies. And the fact is, most members of our microbiome are helpful to us rather than harmful. And where do we get our microbiome? The minute we come out of our moms is where much of our microbiome comes from. And then from that point forward till about the age of five or so, um, we continue to build on that. And we take that microbiome with us for the rest of our lives. And one of the interesting facts about the microbiome is that they live shoulder, we have bacterial vi viruses, other kinds of microbes that live shoulder to shoulder with our own cells. And the estimates are anywhere from at least one microbial cell to every human cell, upwards of three microbial cells for every human cell. So we're kind of outnumbered on that front. And if you consider genes, we have about 20 to 23,000 protein coding genes in our genome. You throw in the genes of bacteria, and that adds about 2 million more. You add the genes of viruses, archaea, protists, and so on, fungi. And we have somewhere, it's estimated, uh, on the order of 4 to 6 million microbial genes that join ours. And this is kind of astonishing if you think about it, because we've always thought of ourselves as purely human pretty different than all other species, but it turns out that that's not really the case, and we are, in fact, you know, quite a bit microbial. And for me, coming out of this health challenge, uh, it became a launching point to ask questions about health. My health, I was obviously thinking about Dave's health, family and friends, everybody. And it led me, I have to tell you, I would never, ever have expected this, to the least loved part of the human body. And that is the human colon. Yes, the lowermost part of our digestive tract. So I want to take you on a journey through the colon. And to do that, I'm just going to point out a couple of geographic features here, OK? And a little bit about its anatomy. If you were to take a cross section through the colon, that middle area is just called the lumen. And if we were to take a close look at that, you'd find a thick layer of mucus. And so our colon, of course, is a big inner tube inside of us. And so whether it's the top, the bottom, or the sides, you've got this nice thick layer of mucus and this very interesting architecture, this thing called a colonic crypt. Now, the hydraulic forces in the colon, if you're a little, little tiny single-celled organism, you really kind of want to stay out of the main flow. That's a rough place. And so you want to be hunkered down in the mucus. And some researchers who are looking at this are actually thinking that members of our microbiome are living down in these colonic crypts. Now, immunologists say, oh, no, that could never happen. We want to keep all the microbes up, up in the lumen. This mucus is a protective layer. This is us. We couldn't have any microbes down there. But it's looking like the more that researchers look, that our members of our microbiome are indeed down in these crypts and certainly are in the mucus. Uh, another key fact about the microbiome is this. Um, well, let me back up. Our immune system, our immune cells, much of it is wrapped around our digestive tract. And of that part around dig our digestive tract, most of it is wrapped around the colon. And so I'm going <clears> to <throat> explain how this works. This is a cross section, again, through the colon wall. You have the lumen up here, that nice thick layer of mucus, cells lining the colon. And here is a wonderful, marvelous kind of cell we should all know more about. It's an immune cell called a dendritic cell. These cells are like intrepid explorers in our body. And one place they are particularly curious and snoopy and on a very need-to-know basis is what's going on in our colon. So here you can see a dendritic cell. It is sort of like a little bit like an amoeba. It can shape shift a little bit and it can slide an arm right up there in between two colon cells and it takes a sample, a sample of what's in the lumen area, what's in the mucus, what's inside of those crypts. And why is the dendritic cell doing this? Because 
it has some PALs, some, some PALs that are also immune cells called T cells. And the reason for that is that this molecular sample that the dendritic cell is, has shows it to a T cell and it will activate that T cell. Until a T cell is activated, it just sits there and it doesn't really do anything. But a dendritic cell comes along with the right kind of molecular sample, also called antigen. If any of you have ever been to an allergist, they're testing for different kinds of antigen. That dendritic cell shows it to the T cell, and the T cell goes, yeah, that's my kind of antigen, and it will activate. And in terms of microbiome research, there's about a dozen or so different kinds of T cells, but two types in particular are of high interest. One is called, excuse me, one is called a T regulatory cell, and these are anti-inflammatory. And you probably have been looking at this image and you're maybe starting to put it together. Some dendritic cells get antigen from certain types of bacteria. Other types, other dendritic cells are getting a sample from another type of bacteria. And so what we know is that some bacteria will activate a T cell into a T regulatory cell. They dampen inflammation. Other types of antigen will activate what's called a Th17 cell. So this is our inflammatory process. Day to day, most of us want to be walking around with things in balance, right? Because we're not, inflammation is, is a normal process when it comes to healing wounds, killing cancer cells, um, dealing with a true pathogen, say the influenza virus or cholera, tuberculosis or something like that. But day in, day out, that's not the situation for most of us. So you, you really want these things to be in balance on this sort of even keel teeter-totter. And what's turning out that it looks like what's going on with our immune system is that it's not just the absence of microbes that are really important for our health, but it's actually their presence as well because of these relationships where some types of bacteria are really necessary to activate these inflammation dampeners. And why do you want inflammation on an even keel? Because when inflammation is happening when it's supposed to be, it's a little bit like, you can think of it like an all-in-one wrecking crew. It comes into a house and it's knocking walls down and it's taking windows out and it's in the process of remodeling things and cleaning things up. But anyone who's ever done a remodeling project knows something always gets wrecked that wasn't supposed to be demolished. And when you have inflammation going on for weeks or months or years, there's a lot of collateral damage to other cells and tissue. And this is where autoimmune diseases can come into play. So <clears throat> this is quite a new view of our immune system and our health. But there's a very good reason that it's taken until 2016 for us to realize that. And it's due to something called germ theory. And that is that once we began to figure out that a single microbe could cause a single disease, we saw this over and over again in the you know, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Uh, people began to see microbes all as bad and all as pathogens. And this is some of the earliest epidemiological work from 1664. And the highest number on here, over 7,000 deaths in one week in the city of London due to plague. This is why we have a view of the microbial world that we do. It has been the bane of humanity over much of our existence. But it's not 1664 anymore. We have largely controlled um, the infectious diseases, at least in the Western world. And can you hear my sound OK? OK. And uh, so we're in the modern world now. And I want to show you these two graphs because they're showing this transition in diseases. Starting right after 
World War II, we saw these huge declines, things like tuberculosis, hep A, rheumatic fever, and so on. And that's because you combine vaccines that were coming online with antibiotics, with clean drinking water systems. By the time the post-war years had hit, we had pretty much controlled, at least in the Western world, most of the dreaded, most dreaded infectious diseases. So we're patting ourselves on the back about that, because that is a very good thing. But on the other hand, as shown in this figure, there were other diseases, asthma, type 1 diabetes, Crohn's, multiple sclerosis, and so on, that we're seeing these precipitous increases in. And so there was a lot of question about that, and it was puzzling why, on the one hand, if we are controlling these diseases, we're getting all of these other ones that are rising. And so if you think back to the slide of the dendritic cell sampling members of our microbiome in our colon environment, in our colon ecosystem, really, what would happen if we were missing some members of our microbiome? Then that dendritic cell is not getting the sample, the molecular sample, that is going to activate a T regulatory cell, the type that quell inflammation. And so there's a hypothesis rolling around, and it's looking like it's becoming um, more and more clear that this is the case, that we are probably missing some of our microbes. And some of this is correlative, and so we know that correlation is not causal, but this is where the research is heading. And there will be, I am sure, in the years to come, um, microbiome researchers are really looking at some of these linkages and relationships. Because every single one of these conditions up here is some, some sort of disordered or perturbed um, perturbation in the immune system. Some of this is autoimmune. Some of this is chronic diseases. And so if we have scrambled our microbiome in ways it stands to reason that our immune system is also somewhat scrambled. and It's not getting all of these signals and cues about what's an enemy and what's a friend and how do I keep you know, inflammation on an even keel when everything is going OK. So there's something. We know that probably antibiotics, everyone in this room probably is putting this together. Yeah, antibiotics can certainly change our microbiome. But there's something else that's not quite so obvious, and that is what we're sending down the hatch, our food, our diet. So in order to understand why this might affect our microbiome, you need to know a little bit more about the digestive tract. And so here's how it works. Just over here, you can see how the uh, numbers of bacteria increase dramatically as you drop down through the digestive tract. And really, the grandest ecosystem in our body is our colon. There, it, is, it is quite a transformational kind of a, a chamber in our bodies. We all need to sort of get rid of this idea that it's an on, sort of an onboard garbage can. Because um, as, I sh as I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, it really is much more like a medicine chest. So what's happening here is food comes in, and by the time it gets right around here to the lower reaches of the small intestine, simple carbohydrates, fats, most of the proteins have been sufficiently broken down by our own digestive enzymes and by gastric juices in the stomach. And they are absorbed out into the bloodstream, carried off to the places in the body that they're needed. But there's something in our diet that we lack the enzymes to, to, to totally break down. And that is the wonderful world of plant foods the botanical world. In foods, the type of molecules that make up whole plant foods are complex carbohydrates. They're a really tough kind of molecule for an enzyme to get into and break apart. And somewhere along the line in our evolution, we decided to outsource the job of breaking down complex carbohydrates to the microbes that live in our gut. And so this is what happens. All those plant foods get down to here, and it becomes tranquil pastures for herds and herds of grazing microbes. 
that's where all the plant foods in our diet are broken down. And, and the process for that is fermentation. One reason our diet has altered our microbiome is that we are not eating as many whole plant foods as we did historically. And so what's happening down here is you've got microbes that are waiting for this food and it cuts out right here at the small intestine. And they're like, well, what about my breakfast, lunch, and dinner? I need food too. And an example of that dietary change is what this figure shows. 1997 and 1910, we ate about the same amount of carbohydrates. And it, it, it really hasn't changed, you know, if you were to pop this out to 2016. But what's changed is the form of those carbohydrates. Fiber. Fiber, we've all heard doctors talk about, maybe spouses nag us to eat it. But what it really means is a whole plant food. These complex carbohydrates have not been torn apart and turned into much shorter chain, much simpler molecules. Over time, our carbohydrate consumption dipped a bit in the post-war years, but it began climbing up rapidly again in the 80s. But this time, most of the form of those carbohydrates are simple carbohydrates, which is really the same thing as sugar. Sugar like is in a candy bar. And so what this has done to our microbiome, that portion that lives in the most wonderful part of our ecosystem, our colon, is that it's kind of getting starved, at least malnourished. And so this becomes a problem if we're relying on our immune system to be communicating with our microbiome in our colon, and we're sort of starving the portion of our microbiome that lives there. And <clears throat> If you're having trouble, we always throw this slide in because we're talking about the invisible microbial world. And so what this is, is this is bacteria that have been colorized, these colors, so they're easy to see, and they are rushing to the banquet table of fiber. This is what the microbial world excels at, is decomposing plant material, right? Dave talked about what happened in the garden and how they could, were able to break down organic matter. Much the same thing is happening in our bodies as well. Um, okay, we're going to put this, I want to connect all the dots now about this diet, microbiota, immunity, and so forth. So in comes the fiber, those whole plant foods. That could be, you know, a, a whole grain. That could be a whole piece of broccoli lettuces, fruits and vegetables, any sort of whole plant food comes in. That fiber, remember, we can't break it down. Our microbiota in the colon get a hold of it. And they churn out some very interesting things. Um, short chain fatty acids is what, the same thing here as fatty acid metabolites. And some of these compounds, these are the waste products of our microbiota in the colon, but to our body, in our cells and tissues, some of these things have medicinal effects, big time. This one in particular, butyrate, is actually an energy source for our colon cells. About 60 to 70 percent the energy that our colon cells use to uh, produce mucus, to divide and replicate, comes from a microbial waste product. We should really think of another name besides waste product for these compounds. I like to think of them um, as medicine. So if we are able to feed our microbes the right kinds of things, they produce these medicines and we can stock our onboard medicine chest. But it gets better. Okay, you know what a dendritic cell looks like, right? Okay, put one on the slide here. That arm, their arm slides up in between these two cells. It gets that butyrate, the molecular sample, comes back down here. This is, these are all these immune cells clustered on the outside of the colon wall. And it shows it to this particular T cell. And that T cell says, oh, yeah, my kind of antigen, butyrate, that turns me into a T regulatory cell, that kind of immune cell that is the inflammation dampener, the kind that we don't have enough of some of us, when it comes to 
certain chronic diseases and certainly some of the autoimmune diseases. So for Dave and I, when we were able to connect these dots, from diet to our colon, immune cells, health, it gave us some ideas, as you might imagine. We began to see that the human gut and the root of a plant are really sort of mirror images of one another. They're very, very similar in how they work, what makes them healthy. And so when it comes to roots, Dave talked about those exudates. Plant roots are pushing exudates out into the soil to feed their microbes. In many ways, our diet, those, those complex carbohydrates down in the colon, are like an exudate. In addition, our colon cells actually produce certain kinds of carbohydrates that the microbiome can, can um, use as an energy and as a food source. So we have this, this uh, symbiotic relationship that's going on both in the gut and around the root. And also, we both have been nattering about these microbial metabolites, and they are produced in both of these environments. And I'll hasten to add that it's thought that at least when it comes to our inner soil ecosystem, that about 40% of the compounds circulating in our bloodstream were made by some kind of a microbe. Not by our cells, but by our microbial cells. And so this is either interesting or disconcerting or both depending on your viewpoint. And then lastly, Dave talked a lot about how the plant defense system is all about this crosstalk and chemical signaling back and forth ceaselessly between the root and the rhizosphere environment and all of the microbes that are living there. And uh, absolutely the same thing is happening in us. And I want to emphasize here that our immune system it's a defense system. It's controlling our inflammation. It's doing a lot of things. And it relies on communication with all kinds of microbes, not just the pathogens that we normally think of our immune system as interacting with. It's also got to be interacting with these other types, the ones that, that tone and tune the levels of inflammation in our body. And what I want to draw your attention to we all maybe have questions, oh, now that I know this, you know, what should I eat? I'll draw your attention to the two largest arrows on this figure, here and here. And this column is just sort of a summary of what's going on with the Western diet. That's what most of us in the Western world tend to eat. The problem with it, it is, it is rich in simple carbohydrates. And that simply does not end up feeding all of the microbes that live in the colon. And as a result, you get this paltry amount of these medicinal metabolites. Contrast it with what we'll call the inner garden diet. And we're not saying that means exclusively plant foods. What that means is a diet that includes a lot of plant foods and as diverse of plant foods as you can think of. And this diet. There's just not, if you're eating a lot of plants, there's not much in the way of simple carbohydrates. They're all made of complex carbohydrates. And so what you get as a result is a bucket load of medicinal microbial metabolites there. And what does that look like? We probably all know this in our heart of hearts and our stomach of stomachs that it's always been about balance, but you have the forces of marketing, you have the excess of food in our society, and can, it can be confusing to figure out what to eat. And so the way Dave and I think about it now is we kind of say, hmm, if we fed our microbiome today, and we sort of envision this plate, which is fill up half of your plate with plant foods. Pretty simple. Here's another kind of plant food, unprocessed whole grains. I think the, war on, the current war on wheat is a little, a little misplaced. Because um, grains turn out to be an absolutely fantastic um, fermentable material for our microbiome down in our colon. And then we're, we're saying, yeah, have protein, whatever form you want to take that in. But keep protein probably uh, at a minimum. As it turns out, we go into this more in the book. It appears that in the Western diet, the amount of protein that we eat 
some of that gets down into the colon, not very digested. And our microbiome, it will break down anything. So what it produces from protein, though, is not medicinal. It is not looking like it's all that good for us and that it can be quite um, detrimental to our colon cells. So that looks like, um, that's why we're, we're saying here you might want to think um, a little more about the quantity of meat in the typical Western diet. And then, of course, few of us think about a diet for the soil, but we need to think about what the soil is eating because of its microbiome and because we rely on the soil. And so what you have here is what we'll call a fertilizer diet. Again, look at these two biggest arrows here and here. And there's a ton of macronutrients. We all know we've probably all used fertilizers on plants. And boy, does that plant look beautiful. You know, flush, big flowers and everything. Well, if you were able to look at the root system of that plant, it would not be pretty. This is pretty pathetic for a root system on a plant. And the consequence of this is that there's hardly any exudates coming off of a root system like this, which means there's hardly any microbes, which means the crosstalk back and forth going on in the rhizosphere is not much either. So what it means is there's hardly anything in the way of these beneficial metabolites for the plant. Contrast that with what we'll call the soil life diet. A lot of organic matter, you boost those microbial populations, they start providing metabolites to the plant, the plant's providing exudates, and you get this marvelous, marvelous root system. This right here, this is a built-in health plan for the botanical world, what we have going on here. And then what does that diet look like? You know this, you get your wheelbarrow, fill that up with organic matter, all different kinds, take that over and feed your soil. So when Dave and I think about the microbiome, um, we talk about it in these three ways. First of all, whether we're talking the soil or our own bodies, it's pretty imperative that we protect what we're born with. Because we know now that the alterations and perturbations, especially early in life, can set you up for problems later in life. So protection is, is paramount. But We've all taken hits, right? We're in the modern world. Every single one of us has had antibiotics. We've probably saved the lives. I know they've helped me out. They've helped Dave out. They're a wonderful thing, but our microbiome can take a hit. So that's where you're looking at restoration. And frankly, there probably needs to be a whole lot more research done on what are called probiotics. Probably many of you know what those are. You can pick them up at the store, the supplement industry. What we need to know, though, is what exactly is in the bottle of a supplement, and is it the right thing for uh, a deficiency in a person's microbiome? So doing research in this area is really, really important. But it looks like it is possible, to some extent, to restore a microbiome. I mean, studies show that when you change um, the diet, there's been experiments done on people and on rodents and you go from a diet heavy in protein and fat to a diet that starts to incorporate a lot of plant foods, and within hours, days, the microbiome begins to change. And certainly, that's what Dave and I did with the garden. As soon as we began feeding the soil organic matter, we saw the manifestation of a changed microbiome. You know, we didn't have before and after sampling, but certainly the texture of our soil was different, qualities were different, and so on. And then if you are going to go to the trouble of doing either one of these things, it is absolutely key to keep cultivating those, those microbes. Any gardener, any farmer, anyone who's ever trying to grow, grow a plant knows you don't just plant it and walk away, right? It needs some cultivation until it's established. And so this is something really important to think about, too. So maybe later tonight, I know it's the end of the day, you all have been working before this and you're kind of fuzzy, you go home. I saw this talk, I'm not exactly sure what it was about. Well, it was something about my root is the gut and the gut is the root and these microbes. 
And we have boiled the concept down to six words, okay? So pretty easy to remember. And they are this. You'll be okay if you just mulch your soil inside and out. So that concludes our talk. Um, we've got the hidden half, of course, out in the lobby. And it, we, we're sort of looking at this book as, as being the middle, the middle piece of um, this whole triptych here. So Dirt, of course, lays out sort of what are some of the problems with what we have done to soil. The hidden half, aha, we know that it's possible to fix it. It looks like we can turn this kind of an environmental problem around. This is um, Dave's solo authored book coming out this May. And what this is about is some uh, extremely innovative farmers who are doing just what this title says. They are bringing our soil back to life. And how are they doing that? They're ditching the plow, they're covering up the soil, and they are growing a diversity of crops, both commercial crops and cover crops. Why? Because you keep the soil well vegetated and you've got exudates. You have an exudate factory flowing into the soil. And that is what makes for healthy crops, healthy plants. So look for that book um, later in the spring. And I think we are happy now to take a few questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Sure. How about here in the in, in the front and then you talked in the book about your tree. And I would hope you would show us the tree. It's so much better than anybody else's tree of the same age. Oh, okay. Uh, I believe that was the red bud tree that we talked about the girth of the trunk and how it had increased in size quite rapidly is what I'm recollecting. Uh, well, all I can tell you is that was um, that is what's called a forest pansy redbud. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the eastern redbud, forest pansy redbud. I did not make that name up, but I will tell you that is a gorgeous, gorgeous tree. It has leaves shaped kind of like a heart, about that big, and it comes in a in a color scheme of burgundy, purple, and green, and that is the beloved forest pansy redbud. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about what we eat. Oh, thank you, Klaus. And whether evolution has invented other ways for our gut to work. Uh, and I was thinking about the Inuit in the north that apparently don't have a lot of fiber in their diet and, and eat fat. Uh, what happens in their gut? And, and do they have a different ecosystem because they eat quite different things than what you just uh, recommended. Yeah, exactly. That, that was a, that's a keen eye that you have there. Yeah, so the Inuit, what do they eat? They eat a lot of protein and a lot of fat in the form of whales, seals, and marine mammals. And long, long ago, each of us, wherever it was our descendants came from, acquired the microbiome not only from our moms, but from nature itself. So, you know, the water we drank, the animals we ate, the plants that we ate, all contributed at some, in some way to our microbiome. And so with the Inuit, it may be that part of their microbiome came from the place in which they evolved, and their bodies are responding very differently to the metabolites that their microbiome is churning out. I know that in about the last six or nine months, somebody, this question is asked a lot because we're curious about it. Somebody um, did some gene sequencing of the Inuit genome, and guess what? They have some genes that can produce molecules and compounds that act, I'm simplifying this, but that act uh, as an antidote, if you will, to some of the harmful metabolites that some microbes can produce with excess fat and protein. So through evolution, their bodies, the process of biology and evolution, they are relying on this wonderful food source in the place that they live. 
And at the same time, their genome says, yeah, there's some problematic metabolites that could come from so eating so much fat and protein, but the human genome is pushing back on that because you don't want to forego such a wonderful food source. The other thing with the Inuit is that uh, in the spring and summertime, at least the traditional diets incorporate a lot of, actually a lot of foraged plant foods, lichens, for example, and these turn out to be um, filled with phytonutrients or phytochemicals. Maybe some of you have heard that term. A lot of phytochemicals have um, really powerful medicinal effects in our body. And so it's thought that, in part, maybe the phytonutrients that they're eating in the spring and summer months are countering, say, any abnormal cell growth that may have accumulated over the winter months. So it's, I think, an example of just how embedded human beings um, are in nature. Somewhere along the way, the Inuit biology has figured out how to contend with these sort of opposing uh, forces. And the, the evidence that it's working is just simply that the Inuit are around. And what makes them sick is when they come um, and start eating a Western diet. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Any though. other questions? Yeah. I wondered, all that you're saying, I'm, I've studied soil a bit, and I, there was an exhibit at the Natural History Museum in New York City about the microbio microbiomes, micro yeah. microbes. Um, which kind of is along the lines of what you're talking about. And I wondered if there is controversy about this. It makes so much sense, what you're saying. But there's usually another side, or at least people who espouse another side. So I wondered about that. Well, there's, um, I think there's a fair amount of controversy on sort of what to think about and what to do about it. But there's, what, there's really not a lot of room for controversy about it. The mechanisms through which these nutrient transfers, the chemical signaling, and the symbioses are actually happening. Um, for a long time, symbioses were not viewed very um, favorably in biology. In terms of these microbe hierarchies and intera interactions, it seems pretty solid that they are there. Where we see a lot of controversy, where I see a lot of controversy, and Anne may either contradict or back me up on it, uh, <laughs> um, is that in how to think about how to characterize those relationships. Because we've spent so long thinking about microbes as germs and that they're all bad, when we're now finding that, oh, actually, the majority of them either don't really do much to us uh, or that in their communities and the way they interact, they can actually benefit our health. And so do you call them good? Do you call them bad? Some of the microbes are good for us in certain circumstances, but not good for us in others. Um, and so how do you deal with thinking about that and characterizing them? So there's a lot of argument over whether you can say that there are good microbes. And to me, a lot of the controversy over that is a sideshow because it, that's a semantic argument. We know, you know, wh whether something that doesn't have a brain can have intentionality and therefore be good or evil, it's like, let's not even argue about that. That's silly. Um, but whether microbes can be good for you it's just as silly to argue that that's not true at this point. Where I think a lot of the controversy is going to lie is in how do we develop new um, treatments and techniques and methods in terms of both human, um, human health, human nutrition, but also in terms of agricultural practices. Because uh, there's a lot of efforts now to sort of develop uh, um, what you might consider the magic microbe solutions. You know, if we could just take this microbe in a pill, or if we could just spray the plant with that microbe. And that's kind of taking germ theory of the one microbe, one disease, and turning it around to the positive end. And I am not at all confident that that's a very uh, solid strategy for going forward, because from what we can triangulate, it's a lot of the community interactions in the microbial world that are setting up some of these symbioses and positive effects. And that's a lot more complicated than identifying a single microbe. It's kind of like, you know, if, if you, what would you know about the ecology of Australia if all you knew about were wombats? You just have a very incomplete picture. And should we, should we do one more question and then move on to the yes, book sign? One more question. And, and we are happy. Please come out to the lobby and if, if you've got a question, because we're happy to natter about this more. 
Um, I've actually been reading about the microbiomes and the research, and Michael Pollan as well. He, he, he boiled it down to seven words, right? Eat mostly plants, not a lot, and I forget. Yeah. But um, not only that, but they say the microbiomes do so much more, like um, keep track of your mental health, yeah. you know, whether you get depression or not. It's, it's so significant. And he also talks about how the whole food industry has destroyed the soil, destroyed what we eat because they push their agenda of, you know, fat and sugar and salt, like with the sodas and everything. So this is wonderful to hear what you're saying and about changing the soil. You know, we can't continue to eat yeah. like this. I mean, I think that with the common the common element here is that the we're starting to understand the microbial mechanisms through which solutions to some of those problems can actually be pulled off in terms of whether it's soil restoration or starting to explain why the kind of diet that you were just describing in terms of the processed food diet, why it's actually bad for us. And if there's one thing scientists are really good at, it's being skeptical about things and challenging things until the mechanisms are laid out and connected. And one of the reasons we wrote this book is we started to see that the science is actually starting to identify what those mechanisms are at a microbial level and that some of the connections people have hypothesized are actually not anti-science, they're really cutting edge science. Um, and that's where the sort, of, the sort of new view of our relationship to the microbial world and new thinking about our own bodies to us is so exciting because it's really a case where I think the science is, is starting to lead us in directions that um, could improve the health of our soil, could improve public health if we really listen to and follow the implications for them. And I, I would just add, I often, when I hear questions like yours, what it triggers in my mind, something um, that we all might want to um, think about, and that is that everything we've been talking about um, reminds me of uh, conservation and protecting a resource. And I think in many ways, both the soil microbiome and the human microbiome are the biggest unknown conservation projects out there. You know, this is, this is a lot bigger than polar bears and seals and wolves and all of that. And if we are able to cast a net around the microbiome of the soil and our bodies and begin protecting it better and begin conserving it before we lose any more, there are a lot of silver linings that come along with that. You know, we will, um, if we're taking better care of the soil, you know, water is cleaner, there's less habitat destruction and so on. And so um, I, I'm, I, I kind of am thinking of this bumper sticker, you know, the biggest conservation project you don't know about, the microbiome. And um, yeah, so uh, I think that's, that's probably it. Yeah, thank you very much. And Bigley, David Montgomery, and we have now thank you. still thank you. the possibility for some books outside. Thank you very much.